Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome to Black Rifle Coffee's podcast. I'm on the podcast with Johnny Strong. Johnny, you might recognize him, I think, most famously up to this point as the man who played Randy Shugart. You played Shugart in Black Hawk Down, mm. which definitively changed my life. I mean, as somebody who was in the military at the time of Black Hawk Down, coming down the pipe as somebody who knows several friends, Tom Satterley, Kyle Lamb, um, Brad Halling, who was on the bird with Shugart and Gordon. That movie and the way it was represented, I, I think in a, a very decent and respectful way, um, brings back a lot of memories. So I was reflecting on it last night when I was watching you. And here we are. That was 22 years ago. Yeah. And I had checked the forums and was looking at some stuff, trying to catch up with you. And seemingly after that movie, you played in a couple other roles, but you disappeared. Mm. And we had talked about it on the on my back deck, looking at the mountains and, re and talking about our, our little mini homesteads and how country life has brought us closer to our families and all the things we find important. What was that that experience like for you in Black Hawk Down? And what changed along the way where you seemingly kind of just vanished for a mm. period of time? Yeah. What, what was that lead up? Well, it's interesting. Like we were talking about, I grew up in Hollywood, so uh, my parents were in the film business. And um, I was kind of, I wasn't one of those, um, God, what do they call them? Like, you know, the child actors that are like, you know, pushed by their parents to, you know, be the Macaulay Culkins of the world, you know, um, which, uh, thankfully wasn't the case for me, but, um, it was introduced to me when I was like five. That was my first job. Dude. I modeled clothes, cowboy clothes, like cowboy boots and Western shirt cowboy hat on this television show called our magazine. And, um, Growing up through Hollywood, like becoming a young man, working on um, different things, I dropped out of high school. And then I worked on a television show called America's Most Wanted. I don't know if you remember that show. I do remember that yeah. show. Great show. Um, and great premise at the end of the day, looking back on my uh, career, is how many television shows are, you know, really m make no difference in the world. And that was a really special special project that like brought a lot of people to justice and, 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 um, gave some closure to families, you know? So it gave um, you purpose. Well, yeah, that was, and really, you know, retrospectively looking back that, that first job of, of doing something that was, was meaningful mm. was important. Mm. And, and I take this with me, you know, now, God, what, 30 years later, something like that, I mean, some almost that, um, I remember, uh, that episode they caught the murderers of these people that um, I played. Oh, wow. Uh, so it was like kind of a special thing. Like wow. some of those episodes they never found or whatever, but this was, um, the episode was, had su um, such impact that um, they eventually caught these guys and brought them to justice. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of cool. So I started there and then you, you go through your career doing one thing or the next and, um, there was always something inside of me, dude, that was, um, that felt like, um, it was missing something like that, you know, that meaning or that special purpose, uh, until Black Hawk Down. Mm -hmm. And that was such a uh, special occasion for me. And I'm, I'll tell you a little story about that was, um, and I've told this before, but I like to share it with some people that might give a shit. Um, I was working out in my house, got a brand new wheat vest. Uh, and so I was crushing myself, push ups, pull ups, um, air squats. And in the background, there's a television show that was on the history channel called deadliest missions. I think it was called the, and I could be getting that wrong, but it was about, and while I'm working out, I'm just listening to it. So I'm not really watching it and I'm listening to it and it's about two snipers that get caught that, that volunteer to go in to protect a downed helicopter. 
and the crew at the helicopter. And I'm listening, and I'm working out and kicking my own ass as usual. And uh, it gets to the part where it, it talks about um, what they did and the courage and bravery and all that kind of stuff. Man, I was moved to tears. I started crying. Hey, this summer you can help Black Rifle Coffee and the boot campaign raise $1 million for veterans. All you need to do is grab a can of ready-to-drink coffee from your local grocery or convenience store from May 31st to August 31st. Every can of ready-to-drink coffee you buy will contribute to making this massive donation possible. Thanks, guys. And you go, you think to yourself, like, why is that moving me like that? You know what I mean? How many shows or things or whatever you, you hear or experience on television or whatever that don't move you at all. It's just, uh, you know, entertainment. And I was moved. And the first thought mm, through my mind was, I can do that. I can, I can show the world. It was the wildest thing. Because it's like a lightning bolt, you know? And I'm sure there's a lot of people go, man, I can do that in the movie, you know? This was like a profound thing that I couldn't explain to you, you know, like a spiritual thing that that most people kind of dismiss as like coincidence. Um, But I knew it. I fucking knew it, man, like in my soul. And then the, the next thought, is how am I going to do anything about that? I, can, I got no fucking power in Hollywood. I'm just a fucking actor. I'm doing this movie, that movie, whatever. And so I kind of like just let it go. But it was, it stuck with me, you know? And I, since I was younger, man, my father got me into training with firearms and stuff when I was five years old. Was my, my birthday present was a, a chipmunk, Ruger chipmunk rifle. Mm. And so I've been shooting and training and stuff. So, and then one day, um, I got um, a phone call to go meet this uh, casting director, one of the best in the business, a girl named uh, Bonnie Timmerman, who did like the Miami Vice series. And she had an eye for like really talented people throughout her career, you know, like finding, you know, different people. She just knew she had an eye for it. And so they did a film called Pearl Harbor, which I read and I thought, man, this is kind of fair. This is like, you know, they, they, um, they, they kind of took Titanic and yeah. just painted an American flag over it, you know? And it kind of bummed me out because I was like, man, what a what a horrific and tragic day, you know? And they're kind of doing this to it. So I, I was kind of a little bit repelled by it. And um, But I went in to meet with Bonnie and I kind of told her how I felt. And she was like, you know, you're the only actor in Hollywood that doesn't want to be in a movie. Like her phone wouldn't stop ringing, but people trying to kick down the door and get inside, you know? And, um, and she said, well, listen, I understand how you feel about, um, I'm, I'm doing a film coming up soon, uh, with Ridley Scott and you'd be really right for it. That, I I don't even remember if she described the film or whatever, just something like that. Right. And it was like, okay, thank you. Love you. See ya. You know? And then, um, I'm on the set of the fast and the furious Mm -hmm. working, uh, um, on that movie. And I just did this scene where this guy's in a car race and I'm walking back and Mark or uh, Vin Diesel sitting in his trailer, like kind of doors open and he's reading the script and he likes to show people what he's doing all the time. <laughs> uh, and I kind of, I'm walking by and he goes, Hey Johnny, have you read this script? And I'm like, no, what is it, man? And he's like, uh, it's about the army. It's called Black Hawk Down. You'd be really right for it. And I go, oh, cool, man. Awesome. You know, because I'm not a, man, I don't know what it is about my personality. I don't know about you, but if I don't connect spiritually with people, I I feel myself magnetically being pushed away from them. Yeah. You used the word repelled. Okay. Yeah. You know, I, like, yeah. I don't know. It's a strange thing, man. And and it's like different. Areas. So I was like, okay, dude, you know, have fun. I went to my trailer. But I heard that, like, oh, it's about the army, whatever, you know. And so I um, called my manager. I said, there's something called Black Hawk Down. I don't know what it is, but um, I just heard about it. Find out. So uh, my manager does what they do, and they call me, and they say, okay, it's a it's a movie, and Bonnie Timmerman's casting it. She's already wants to bring you in on it. 
you know, it'll be a couple of weeks, whatever. So I eventually, um, they send me what's called sides or the breakdown. You know what that is? No. Okay. So it's called a breakdown. They, they faxed it to me, man. Back in the day of faxes, but, uh, prior to the fucking internet, you know, <laughs> the olden days for you kids out there. <laughs> so they, um, they send it and it's a breakdown of the film. It's about this. These are the people making the film. These are the characters. So, um, Delta operator, uh, so-and-so does this in the film, uh, Ranger, so-and-so does this in the film. And I'm reading through it, and I, I look at the Delta guys. I'm like, that's kind of fucking cool, you know. Like, I'm not even putting anything together at this point. I'm just looking, and I go, I, I respond to that. So I call back, and I go, Oh yeah, I really like these roles. And they said, Well, the sides, which is basically they send you a scene for you to go audition on. Like, if I said, Mike, I want you to be in my movie. The guy's name is Ron, and he's you know fishing, and you're trying to tell your buddy that you're about to be de uh, redeployed. And so the scene plays out, right? So uh, they send me the scene. It's about a young ranger, 18 years old, first deployment. Um, he's hitting the femoral artery. He's bleeding out. Mm. And he's with his brothers. That, yeah. you know, I don't know if you remember the scene. I do remember uh, that. Yeah, it's tragic. Uh, based on a real event. Yeah. So um, and there was a part of my personality was like, you know, that's not what you want to do. Like I knew it wasn't. And I called and I said, hey, this is not what I want to do. There are these Delta guys that are the special operations guys that I feel more connected to that. And they said, well, everyone's reading. All the actors are reading this one scene. And so I was uh, found myself in a difficult position. It's like I knew that that wasn't what I was going to do. How do I deal with that? Because if I go in and I do a kick-ass job at this, that's what I'm going to get. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I'm sure in your career you've, um, you learn, be careful what you ask for. Or yeah. Be careful what you're really good at because you'll, they'll put you in that position. Yeah. So, so anyways, uh, sorry, I'm not taking forever to tell you the story, but, um, there was, uh, a moment where I said, all right, I'm going to go in and do this, but I'm going to read it. And the way I perceive what a Delta guy would be, a guy who's been training with the best of the best, who's, who's, you know, who's just kind of, um, put in a position to train differently than these Rangers, these young seasoned 18, guy. yeah, yeah. season guy. Yeah. That's kind of my perspective of it. So I go in and I read and they put you on tape, like cameras like this, you know, and, um, I read it like a Delta guy. And, uh, I had kind of, my hair was a little long. I got my beard out a little bit and she knows what I'm doing. She knows. And she goes, Johnny, this guy's 18 years old. He's really scared. Uh, you know, this kind of stuff. And I'm listening and I'm like trying not to give away the, the secret here. And I go, Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's do it again. And I did it the exact same way. <laughs> And she knew, I could see in her eyes, she's looking at me like, okay, Johnny, you know, thank you for coming in, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, all right, thanks, Bonnie. You know, and left, forgot about it. And um, some time later, I, and I went back to just training, like going to um, shoot my rifles and do that kind of stuff. And I got a phone call, do you have your passport? And uh, I said, yeah, why, what's up? And they're like, you're going to North Africa for Black Hawk Down. And I, and I, finally came around oh wow okay well what's the role and they said well we'll send you over the the um breakdown of the role and they sent over and i remember it just being one page with two roles and the two roles were um so delta operator randall sugar gary gordon you know crazy man and that was really impactful because you knew the whole time that that was meant to be you and in the movie if you guys remember black hawk down those roles in their position there wasn't a lot of words saying they, they didn't speak a lot but it was so impactful oh man. it was the most powerful i think 
I mean, Black Hawk Down, personally, is one of my favorite movies in the world. And I, I premiered it. I, I saw it the first day it came out in Fayetteville, North Carolina, right, right outside of Fort Bragg. Cool. And in that audience, there was a lot of operators from the unit from Delta that were in the audience. I know because I was in the Army going to selection at the time yeah. for Special Forces selection. And um, that was such a powerful moment when those men requested to go in and protect uh, Michael Durant, the 160th pilot, who was surrounded by enemy. enemy. Um, I talked to Brad Halling about it, who was on the bird that took an RPG. I talked to the helicopter pilot who was flying that bird because he worked in the FBI and I ran into him oh, in yeah. Libya. So very powerful moment. What did what at, at the moment that you saw that and you you were going to uh, uh, Morocco right you guys mm, yeah. Morocco how did that feel for you because it, it seems like purpose is what was driving you and these things were collectively happening in your life where you're like I'm not going to do it unless there's a purpose how did that make you feel well, well this changed my whole perspective of um, um, my place in the world as far as my career was concerned, um, being able to participate in that and be, uh, you know, kind of been bestowed the honor of betraying Randy, um, and sort of like carrying that torch, um, to show the rest of the world, you know, it spoiled me. It spoiled me because m the majority of films in Hollywood, no one fucking cares. Yeah. And, and a lot of, a lot of it is really just kind of, um, um, disposable content. And, uh, I, I, it just, after doing it, I was like, it was really difficult when people would send me projects or scripts or whatever afterwards to get motivated. Cause you're like, man, I just did this thing that was like, you know, to me meant something way bigger than anything else I've ever done. Mm -hmm. So, um, and my, and the reason why, you know, early when we were talking about how I disappeared was just wasn't motivated to do anything because there wasn't anything of any significant value or meaning that was coming my way. So I decided to just go make music, which to me as an artist, I've been making music since I was a kid. And, um, and I felt like, uh, there was a deeper connection there to my creator and, and the spiritual world where I wasn't getting that from these scripts that were being sent. And so I just was like, fuck it. I'm going to go make music, you know? And I did that for a while until somebody called me and was like, Hey man, I'm, um, this guy wants to make, uh, you know, uh, put your music in his movie. And so I kind of assessed like what it is that I wanted to do with the rest of my career. Mm -hmm. You know, my life is my family and my, you know, all that kind of stuff. But career wise, like, what am I going to do? Uh, and I realized like the calling for me since I was a kid was always to m be a filmmaker. And in Hollywood, brother, they don't give you opportunities like that. They want to compartmentalize you and go, Mike, you're a fucking actor. You're a this or you're a that. And that's where, that's the, that's the X you're going to stand on. And there's so many people trying to do things. And to me, I was like, I want to write it. I want to film it. I want to act in it. I want to do the music to it. So, um, try to figure out the path for that. How do you figure out how to get there? You know? So my thinking was, okay, I'm going to star in some smaller budget independent films, build up my name so that, you know, there's a fan base there and, uh, and then eventually make my own films. And that's sort of what I, how I approached the next, like, you know, 10, 15 years of my career. And that's what I did. I did a couple films that became like kind of old, um, classics, um, where, where also I could showcase my what I do in my, uh, everyday life, like training, mm. you know, there's a lot of actors that, uh, they show up to Taryn Butler's place or something for a couple of weeks mm. and they re run the same drill over and over until they get it right. And then they can get filmed and have it look good. Like for me, m every week is training for me, yeah. you know? Um, cause that's part of your lifestyle. Yeah. You it's know, like a hobby. Yeah. And that's, uh, you know, 25 years ago, uh, my friend, got me into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and, and mixed martial arts training. And so I've been doing it for a quarter of a century in the third degree black belt. 
And that changed my life incredibly. You know, like I heard you're starting your journey on that or you know, involved in that. Um, and, you know, that's kind of what I do. So I was able to showcase that in front of the camera, you know, and, uh, but the projects weren't, didn't have the same meaning. And so I was in, I wasn't really all in because I was still missing something. So cut to, you know, 10, 15 years later, I finally was, I, I made the decision. I woke up, dude, and I was like, I'm going to make my own film and write it and uh, help produce it and direct it and do everything for it. And I had a profound moment where um, I realized what the film would be about when I was making my breakfast daughter. I mean, uh, excuse me, making my daughter breakfast one day. I was sitting in my kitchen and I was uh, making eggs and sausage for her. And she was around two and a half years old. And we locked eyes and made this conscious connection. Dude. You know, prior to that, they're like a little baby and they're nursing and they're doing their thing. And so you're like, yeah, I love this primitively. I want to protect it and everything. But I made that conscious connection with her. And I wanted to share that with the world who a man is before that moment and who he becomes after, you know? So profound. Oh, bro. Oh, it gives me chills. <laughs> I mean, I, I have the same moments with my daughter. And same thing, like, you know, she's just a, she's eating, pooping, sleeping, and then she becomes a human being. And that connection, especially for daughters, like I have a son as well, like you do. It's different. It's different. It's so different. Well, I, I heard something awesome, man, and maybe you've heard it before. <clears throat> For um, a father and a daughter, um, she is his last love, mm. and she, uh, he is her first love, mm. and it's this like it's so ethereal crazy. connection that you can't explain to somebody. And it's the same for mothers and sons. Yeah, know? yeah, it is. There's something special there. So mm. that's what I did. You know, I had that moment. And I realized that could be the story that I could tell the world and, and have be, you know, make something meaningf meaningful again. You know, Black Hawk spoiled me to be able to make something impactful and meaningful that had purpose. And, and War Horse One is the return to that, you know? Let's talk about War Horse One because okay. by the time this comes out, um, it's going to be available, like just recently available online. And this is, this is an outlier outside of convention, which is Hollywood and how they process and produce yeah. and, and put out movies. What's so different about this? Because you, you said you wrote it. You actually starred in it. Yeah. Did you direct it? Did you produce it? Like, how does that work? And how difficult is that? And then you have a line out where it's, is it an independent film considered? Or is it like on a media platform? How, how do you get all this together, man? It sounds like a, a challenge, an entrepreneurship and personal challenge. Uh, it's Herculean to, to put this together. Yeah. Um, I had help, which was great. Um, yeah, you have an idea and how do you make it happen? I mean, I always tell people, I'm like, you know how many people wake up and say, I'm going to make a movie mm -hmm. every fucking day. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, uh, the process to make that happen is extremely difficult. I made it outside of Hollywood because I'm not really a committee guy. You know, if I have an idea or, or, or some sort of creative project, having 10 people throw in their two cents and try to manipulate something into like this engineered or fabricated thing to me is like, I'm not interested. I want to, you know, if you have a song or an idea or whatever, I want to create that and make that and not have it be you know, um, molested by other people's ideas because sometimes, right. You know, and this is no offense to anyone else, but you could be in a room with five people. Right. And, my, uh, and four of them say, Hey, I got this idea. I got this idea. And one of them might be the shittiest idea you ever heard, but it's the only one the guy's got. Mm -hmm. And you're like, God, how do I tell this guy? It's a terrible idea. Yeah. Great job, man. I got some good, you know, let me think of, let me sit on that, you know? So I, I, I prefer to just, let it all come from one source. Um, and putting together, um, 
I had worked with um, a guy on two other films and I, I called him. I said, hey, man, I'm going to make my own movie. Do you want to make a movie with me? You know, because he had made movies and he kn knew the process of how to put those things together as a producer. Mm -hmm. And um, he's like, well, what do you have in mind? I said, well, it's, you know, the basic idea is me. I'm stuck in the mountains and, I'm, you know, uh, I'm in danger of being killed by the bad guys and trying to protect this little girl, you know. And um, he's like, yeah, yeah, and and I, uh, I'm in, and 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 I felt like if I could offer him something participatory in it, like co-director, co-writer, whatever. So um, he was like, all right, I'm in. I wrote first like 50, 60 pages in three days, and uh, I was off to the races, man. And put it together, super small crew, and and you asked about independent, like a lot of people they. They've been gaslit by the movie industry. If you know anything about big industry, they try to gaslight people into thinking one thing or the other. So Hollywood has a tendency to go, this movie's made in Hollywood, so it's legitimate. Mm. It's good. It's whatever, right? So they, it's a presentation thing. And then they created this term called B-movie over a period of time. And it originally was a studio would either acquire a lower budget movie mm. or push their funds to make lower budget movies to accompany their bigger budget movies in the movie theater. So B movie was a, just a normal industry term used to describe, you know, uh, movies that accompanied these other bigger movies. And then it turned into a insult. That's a B movie, a B rated actor. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And what that is, it's a gaslight so that the industry can kind of control the way people, right? The consumer looks at a uh, product or looks at these things, these creations that are made. Um, but for me, this was a full independent, private financing, very small crew, all of us working on this project to make this thing special. And it wouldn't be what it is if we did it in Hollywood. It would be something completely different and that's you know i'll tell you what the the response has been from people like uh that see the trailers that that even like the screenings that i have dude like the one of the best compliments that i've gotten is from people coming up and going man this is totally not what i was expecting because they because a lot of times you know in the movie business i'll give you a little thing here is if you want to make something independent the one of the only ways you can financially um, distribute something successfully in the independent space is either a horror film or an action film. Mm. If you go, oh man, I got this great idea for a comedy love story. Good luck selling that. Thing. Mm. Good luck making your money back if you spend money on it. Mm. So those two things, the action and the horror uh, genres. Those are the ones that still make money independently. Is it because they do well via the audience? Yes, exactly. Okay. That's yeah. the one that's still kind of consumed uh, on a bigger level. Yeah. You know, um, Hollywood could put out a love story and they'll put 20 million to make it. They'll put half that budget to market and promote it and then make, you know, but still a lot of those things, they lose their ass. But action films and um, horror films are the ones that really kind of can still generate money through distribution mm. so i kind of knew like i wanted to tell the love story of what happens to a man when uh he realizes that uh his daughter is all that matters you know like you would literally suffer every pain gladly for that little girl and how do you sell that you know what i mean and yeah. successfully sell it so that people can make their money and all that kind of stuff so I Trojan ho horsed it, man. I was like, all right, let's make an action movie. But really, we're making a love story. Don't fucking tell me. Looking for a quick and easy way to grab your favorite Black Rifle coffee roast? Well, you could find America's Coffee on the shelves of your local Walmart. Stock up on your favorite roast as well as several Walmart exclusives you can't find anywhere else. No need to worry about waiting for shipping or having to drive all the way across town to find your favorite Black Rifle coffee roast. Whether you're filling up for an early morning hunt or just need a pick-me-up during a busy day, stop by Walmart and grab a bag of Black Rifle Coffee today. Yeah. You know? And and a lot of times in the action community, which unfortunately, sometimes the word action movie, to me, I hear that and I go, 
It's a bad word, man. Because because people in the eighties, once um you know uh, VHS and putting movies out on home video became a popular thing, you had all these people going, yeah, fuck it, let's just blow that up. This guy will rip his shirt off, and you know we'll do this, and and we'll still make our money back, and people will eat that shit up. For me, I don't, I don't have any satisfaction in it. Like to me, that's like disposable content. I don't want to make that. I don't want to be a part of that. Even if it's cool guy shit, like uh, I'll tell you, I, I avoid the cool guy shit when making action movies because violence is brutal. Real violence is brutal, and and it's tragic. Like the last thing, every day we should all wake up going, well, let's avoid this at all fucking costs, you know? Um, we have a bloodlust, you know, in our species. It's a strange thing. Like I, 25 years of doing jujitsu and, and MMA, and I love watching uh, ultimate fighting and, and mixed martial arts competitions. But I don't love it for what the average fan drinking a beer like is just waiting for someone to get knocked out i look at it much deeper than that you know i think there's an epigenetic component to some of us that um i don't know if i was on a hill one time in the past you know with all my other brothers with my spear and shield looking across another hill going man we're gonna fucking take all these scalps out let's go you know i don't know what that is but i don't know why have that in me, but it's in me. Mm. Um, but I know how brutal it is, the reality of that mm. and war and things like that. Like this should be avoided, but there's a part of me that like, understands it mm. as a savage and, and embraces it. And maybe it's just pushing yourself as a human being um, to overcome things, you know, to be, to be that committed to go all the way, or to be all in. I'm an all or nothing kind of guy. So, but, um, so back to the movie. Sorry, I got lost on a tangent there, man. Um, this is that project for me, like to try to go back to doing things that have meaning, you know? So maybe I'll do, and after this, maybe two years will go by, three years, and I'm, I'll do one, another thing that, that I can create that has meaning, you know, actors that are in this movie or that movie or whatever. I'm not interested. Most most people in Hollywood, whether it's they're chasing popularity, fame, or revenue, or the combination of all those things, that doesn't seem to drive you. I mean, obviously, if money was the thing, you're not a money guy because um, you didn't stay in L.A. You decided to leave to push your family out. It's that defined purpose. What is the purpose in this movie, War Horse One, with the story? Is it that love story? Is that the... Is that the purpose that you wanted a creative outlet for you to like be able to tell something? Because you 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 obviously wrote it, but did you write it for yourself? Was it something that you wanted to put yourself in that position? And and did you accomplish what you set out for as an objective? Were you satisfied with the end product when it was all said and done? Absolutely. Uh, at this point in my life, before let me I'll, I'll preface this by saying. When you're an artist or when you do anything, you know, um, the reward system that you learn, right? Originally, you don't express yourself for any reward. You're expressing yourself to work through things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Issues you may have or whatever. Um, whether you pick up, a, for me, as an artist, it's picking up an instrument, or writing, or performing, or doing something, right? Um, the impetus of the action is to express yourself. The downside is after you do that in life, uh, you are confronted with moments of some sharing it with people and have them reward you with what a great song, what a great movie, what a thing. And so you kind of, at least for me, for a minute there in my life as a young man, teenager, early 20s, I got sidetracked by uh, the reward system. I would express myself, but then I would look for like people, hey, check this song out. Check this out. Check this out. Um, 
which is a natural thing, right? It's the attaboy or the good boy or whatever, you know? Um, but then I, I don't know when it changed, but it changed to the, I don't fucking care what people think. Mm. I'm just creating this for me. Like I make music for me to listen to. When I work out in my little gym, I listen to my music. When I, you know, watching this film or that, that's for me, the gratification and satisfaction is the, the act of creation so that I can have a deeper connection with my creator and live in that spiritual realm. And, um, the result, the serendipitous result of that creation and being able to, that being able to connect with other people, it's an accident, mm -hmm. happy accident. Wow. That's wonderful. You know, that's not the intention. I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, people that chase that, like, let's make a movie that people are going to love. I'm not, I don't, I take no motivation from that. And money, man, it's money's useless. Um, joy, satisfaction, experience, happiness. These are the, these are the things that I chase, you know, um, spiritual, mental, physical growth. And, um, you know, that's to me, if there is an afterlife, I could take that with me. If I made a billion dollars and don't mean a fucking thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, did I accomplish my mission? Absolutely, man. There are moments where I watch this film in my studio where I did all the post production stuff. And even with my girl, man, sometimes we'll just sneak in there and sit down and watch it. You watch it and it hits you in this way where you it's it's my connection to God. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's hard to explain to people because our society has been so um manipulated into thinking bullshit is important, you know? And it's a bummer because you know, there's a whole other component to this life that's important. And that is the beauty of War Horse One. And that's why it's like, man, I've had these amazing moments where people are like, and it's not the reward system. It's like an actual genuine conne a connection. So like you could watch a movie and you go, yeah, bro, that was cool, man. That was cool. I like when you shot that guy in the face. Fucking great. Have a nice day, Johnny. Sure. That's, that's the surface. Those are the chocolate chips I put in the movie for those people. You know, mm. but the people that go, I had a great moment. There's a friend of mine, Glenn Eberly Sock. He has a great company. He's a, just a fucking great dude. And after I screened the movie, I invited him to the first screen. I ran into him in the bathroom. So he's washing his hands and I'm washing my hands. I'm kind of a germaphobe. So after shaking everybody's hands, I'm in there washing my hands. And he's in there and he's like, he sees me. Johnny, holy shit. This movie's really good. Mm. I'm like, I know. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> you know, like for me, it, and he goes, no, no, you don't understand. Like, it's really good. Mm. Like, because I think most people just kind of assume like, oh, he's my buddy. He made a movie. It's going to be what it's going to be. Yeah. But like, it touches people. And that to me is like, I'd, I'd much rather share something with somebody on a spiritual, meaningful level so that they go, man, that, that creation brought some sort of joy and satisfaction in my life that was, that I felt deeper than everything else, mm. you know? Yeah. It's like John Wick. It's like, I don't care that he killed a whole bunch of bad guys. I care that he did it for his puppy. His yeah. <laughs> he killed all those people for his dog. And I noticed that when I saw the trailer which has a lot of views on youtube and i noticed when you posted it um which i love your social media because you just don't give a shit i could tell um because you're not driven by that popularity but i i see the the trailer and all the comments and the feedback it's just one people are like johnny's back which is really cool sure you know you had a a really good following, uh, at least seemingly on the surface, a very positive impact on people's lives. And yeah. it seems like a, a positive overall experience. But then you look at this film and that two minute trailer, I was like, whoa, this is different. 
This isn't just the standard, you know, you see the Black Hawk going down in the wood line. You see the, the gunfights, but then you see the little girl. And that mm. little girl, when I see her, reminds me of the little girls I saw in conflict, but also reminds me of my little girl. And it's like, what would you do for that little girl? Fucking anything. Yeah, anything. You'd burn it to the fucking to ground. The ground. Um, and that's what I think is really impactful. And I haven't seen the film, and I, I hope to, to see it very soon. Um, it comes out July 4th. By the time this airs, it would have already dropped. How do you get it out and disseminate something that's as powerful and independent like this? What's the means and methods behind getting it out? They found me. Mm. Um, you know, what, what? what's that old thing? If you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. um, that's my uh, kind of um, prime mover is like make something meaningful mm. and you won't have to fucking convince people to, mm. to consume it, to want it. Yeah. And that, and that thing you feel that's different it's not an accident. That's on purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and I think everything, Mike, in life is, uh, you know, on that side is by way of intention. What's your intent? What do you want to make? Want to make a m movie or a song or a podcast or whatever that is bullshit, that doesn't really matter, that's superficial, that, that is all surface driven? to pump some likes or whatever the fuck it might be? Or do you want to make something that touches people's spirits? Like to me, that's all I want to do. That's, that's my prime move. Um, so I didn't care. And uh, I'm sure my financier would be like, <laughs> fuck. Um, but honestly, I don't care. If it, for me, if it makes me a dime, I don't want a dime. Mm. The more money you have in your pockets, the heavier you are, you know? And I don't want that. I like my, in Morocco, going back to Black Hawk, I remember, man, I was walking through the, uh, the market there. I think they called it the Medina or whatever. And uh, there was a dude selling something. I forgot what he was selling. And he looked at me and goes, you're free as a bird. You're free as a bird. Mm. And I was like, he knew it. He knew it. He saw it in me, man. And it was a strange little moment, dude. And there was like, I think I was with a handful of other actors or whatever. And they were like buying lamps or whatever the hell they were buying. And I was just doing my thing. And this one guy looked up at me. I'll never forget it, man. You're free as a bird. And that's the way I like to be. I think it's, for me, it's a, it's a great place to be. And, um, so in answer to your question, uh, I just made it to be this beautiful thing, you know? And um, we got a phone call one day um, by a distributor, and they were like, we saw your trailer. We, we want, can we watch the movie? And I was so protective of it. How protective of your children are you? Oh, yeah. Man, this is how I am about my, my baby. Oh, yeah. this is my baby. And I even protected it from people within the project. No, no, closed all the, locked all the doors. Like, this is something special, you know? And um, I talked to the guy who reached out, Brennan, shout out, Brennan. He reached out to me and, and I said, hey, man, before anything, let's just have a phone call. Let's just talk. So uh, we got on the phone and I said, um, tell me about your company, you know? I, I'm sure most people that make a movie independently, and I know a lot of them, and I've worked with them, and even my co-director, I've seen what he went through on making the movies that he made that were his movies. Man, when you're done with a movie, you're like, you hear anybody offer you money, you're like running for it. Mm. But for me, I was like, no, tell me about your company. What, what's your goals? What, what, you know, and. And he explained, like, it's a family-run company, da 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 and he told me the name of his company, and I looked it up, and I remember having, and these are these spiritual things that happen in life. There's no such thing as coincidence, right? Mm -hmm. Everything's intertwined on a quantum level in this matrix. Mm -hmm. And so I remember watching a movie of one of my favorite Hong Kong directors, a guy named Johnny Toe, 
he's more action centric, but he, he tries to make meaning out of it, which is awesome. And it was a company called Wellgo USA. And they did like, uh, they put out the Ip Man about Bruce Lee's uh, yeah, yeah. feature. Yeah, that's a great. So, um, family run company, we love your movie, da da da, or the trailer, we'd like to see the movie. And I was like, okay. And so I talked with them and I said, listen, I, I want to explain this to you. This isn't an action. This isn't like a mindless, like, thing. This is a special movie and I care deeply about it. And I want to make sure that the partners I partner up with on this understand that. Mm. So I'm going to let you watch the movie. You tell me how you feel. I want to hear how you feel about it. So a couple other companies did the same thing. They contacted me, saw the trailer, and had the same kind of conversation. And Brandon came back to me and, and explained what he felt about the movie. And it was what I feel about. And so there was other more money involved from other people and stuff like that, that, that wanted the film. And, and I was like, I want to go with the people who understand it, who care about it, who are going to help me bring that to the world, like with care, mm. you know? Yeah. That's a tough thing in the, in the movie business, but there, there are people who don't care. Mm. It's all about money. Even in all business, I'm sure you know, money is a weird thing that has been created that motivates people in such a strange way. You know, you'll see people, right? How often, with care, do people stab each other in the back and fucking step over people's, you know, bodies to get what they want? I don't see that a lot with love and care. Mm. I see that with money. Yeah. I see that with power, with fame, with these, you know, these strange material material world aspects of our humanity that have poisoned us in a lot of ways. So, uh, yeah, he cared about the movie, and and that's how it happened. I said, okay, you care about it. Let's talk about it. Let's figure out how we're going to put the movie out. And this is all the way with everything: the poster artwork, the trailers. Every, everything that was created for this movie, I've held its hand all the way through the process to make sure it wasn't molested in any sort of stupid, you know, kind of half-assed way. You know, it seems like it's a, uh, a unconventional way to release a movie because you can go online and you can get it. You could tether it to a TV. Sure. How, what's the what's the platform? That people can watch. well movie theater man on on it's going to be out in uh, select theaters on July uh, on June thirtieth, um, and then on uh, Independence Day July fourth, which is appropriate. Um, it's going to be out on all the digital platforms, Vudu, iTunes, you, uh, you know, um, Apple, all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So you could download it. Well, the crazy it. thing, Mike, is I made this what I consider a little movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's been competing with these three hundred million dollar movies from Hollywood. Yeah, why is that? Mm. Why is looking that? For meaning, likely be, yeah. because we've lost something in our world, and this is the type, you know. And it's so small. I don't want to like be like flying the flag that I'm fucking bringing back, you know, uh, meaning. Because there are people that are trying to do things. You're trying to do it with your podcast and with your with your companies and 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 your, the message that you have. Um, my skill set, my wheelhouse, brother, is movies, is art, is trying to like do that same thing, you know, give that back to the world, like go, hey, that shit we thought was important, you know, um, this this film and people felt it, felt it, you know, with their spirits, and that's why I think it's wild. I'm sure there's people in Hollywood looking at this shit going. How the fuck is this movie? How is this? How is this happening? They spend hundreds of millions of dollars to convince people to buy their shit. Where I've been hiding, you know, like I've been like, no, you're not allowed. To, it's a secret. You're not allowed in the room. Type of shit, you know. Mm. So I think it's special, man. And when you see the film, when you get a chance to see it. Um, I often tell people this, and I don't mean it in an offensive way, is whether you love it or whether you hate it, it doesn't change the way I feel. 
you know, but there is this little thing inside of me that when people connect with it, like on a real level, I'm like, oh my God, that shit. Like, like you lock eyes, like, you know, uh, there's a great mo moment in one of my favorite movies, Jeremiah Johnson, where, uh, they're, they ha where he has this moment where he's trapped a beaver and he looks over at his wife and he's like, <laughs> you know, like got it's it. that moment, like you got it, you know, we got it. It's fucking awesome. How do you, how do you move on to the next chapter of this? Is it seemingly, this is obviously something that's needed and how does your op tempo manage something like this? Do you just set that aside and you say, all right, we've turned the page. It's time to focus on the next objective and, and you're taking one mission at a time and, and have you identified that? Yeah. Um, create an existence for yourself, right? Make your own opportunities, especially in the film business. It's a strange thing, man, where the industry has convinced a swath of people that you must prostitute yourself mm. at all costs for the opportunity. And I am a absolute advocate for everyone to turn their back to that. Mm. Don't, don't, you know, um, destroy your integrity as a human being for a job. Like, you know, um, search for a, a, a deeper meaning of your, your career, right? Because a lot of people, you know, I've heard this fucking thing, man. It's like, it's just a movie business. We're just making movies. We're not, it's not, you're not curing cancer or this, that, the other. This is what I spend my life doing. Yeah. This is, you know how much time and fucking effort I put into this? It is life and death for me on a lot of levels. And it's profoundly impacting our society as a culture. Right? If you do what, well, man, this is, yeah. so, and I'm the only person that I've really, uh, been around that talks like this. Um, my obligation is films are the modern cave painting. This is how we educate and inspire the next generations. What's good? What's evil? What's right? What's wrong? There's a, there's a depth to that. A lot of people aren't looking at that, bro. You know how many people waking up in Hollywood not ever fucking going to have that thought in their mind? They just go, we're going to put, you know, Joe Blow in this and it's going to make this much money and it'll sell this many uh, toys and all this kind of shit. You know? For me, I'm not interested in that. But I want, if our children, right, watch War Horse 1 and they take away from it that there is value in having the courage to risk everything to protect innocent life. Mission accomplished. Huge. You know? Yeah. So, and as far as, you know, my um, sort of uh, outlook on what's next and how, how do I keep approaching it is, um, is there's a great like thing and I'm probably going to fuck it up. But have you ever heard the story about the dog and the elephant? Right? So there's a dog and an elephant, and they get pregnant at the same time. And a couple months later, the dog has a litter of puppies, and the elephant's still pregnant. The dog looks up at the elephant and says, What happened? I had all my children. You're not even, you don't even have a child yet. And the elephant says, Well, we'll give it time. Give it time. A few more months pass, months pass. The dog's pregnant again. And the elephant is still pregnant. The dog has another little litter of puppies. And well, I've got two little puppies. i got 12 puppies running around in yours. And then finally the elephant has its baby. And the baby starts to move around. And the dog says, wow, yeah, yeah, I feel bad for you. You only have one baby. And I've had all these babies. And the elephant looks at the dog and says, when my baby takes a step, the world will hear it. Mm. When my baby takes a step, the earth will it. You know? So that's my outlook. One at a time. And make each operation uh, 
meaningful. You know, mm-hmm. that's what I'm up to. Crazy man, you're good. I don't know about you're good, that. You're a good communicator. <laughs> I, I'm enthralled. I usually run my fucking mouth all, all the whole time. Hey, yeah, I saw. I, I have a tendency, man. Like, language is so important to me, you know. And and I and I try to choose my words wisely, uh, because each word matters that you speak, and not only the word, but the intention behind it and the meaning behind it. Uh, we don't get many opportunities to communicate spiritual. Mm-hmm. It's all, hey, bro. Yeah. Like in a, Short form. Yeah. And to me, it's like um, this kind of opportunity where you and I can discuss this kind of thing. And, and maybe, there's, maybe there's someone out there that'll hear that shit that was thinking the same shit. And uh, they might be like, I'm alone. Like... Oh, you and I were talking on your porch. I don't know if I'm a pessimist or an optimist, you know. Maybe I'm uh maybe an uh, objectivist uh, where I just try to uh, observe the world and hope for the best, but I realize that I'm not I'm not uh counting on anything to go right. You know, put the maximum effort out spiritually, mentally, physically about with the people that I'm around. And I have a very small circle, you know, um, to me, that's what's important in this life, you know, and there's a special thing in the movie that, um, when, when you see it, you'll, you'll have this takeaway, um, where the little girl says to, um, my character, um, you know, how did you, how did you end up finding me? Because my character finds her, her family was ambushed by insurgents and, uh, she's the only survivor so he takes her to this cave for safety. He's sitting there and he says, well, my helicopter was shot down. And she says, uh, well, where are your friends from the helicopter? Oh, they're in the crowd. And I fell out with the helicopter. And she says, you fell from the sky like an angel? And he says, uh, he smiles and says, uh, you know what? And she says to him, the metaphor for that, right, is for us, we've done, I'm sure, some questionable things in our lives, men, but, uh, the innocence that that child represents, right? They could, we can still be a beacon of hope for these kids. Mm. Uh, my daughter, right? All the things that I've maybe done in my life that were questionable, she'll look right past, it, you know? She'll see, like, this person like when like about that conscious connection i'm saying he's all in for me you know and i think that message for humanity is a and uh, that's what i wanted to give to the world fuck we're gonna watch this movie man i want to let's watch this shit right now (laughs) johnny i appreciate you man i i you know i heard a lot of good things about you a lot of mutual friends we were just talking outside about some of them um i would ask you like where the fuck do you go for links and and like to find you and stuff but i don't think you want to be found don't worry about that man the, the, our social media society is uh it's it's a it's a negative reward system it's to make you think that popularity is important it's it's designed to make you desire things that um, don't support healthy mental states um, doesn't support you know like um, true uh, value and uh, integrity uh, even though like you know I'm sure you got a gazillion followers and 
Instagram or YouTube or whatever, or even now, it's like the way we're sharing this with the world. I wonder sometimes I go, why doesn't an EMP just wipe out all this shit? And that'd be fucking great. I would why celebrate. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> and, and, and we could go back to living neighbor to neighbor. Yeah. Like, yeah, you know, but, but the duality of it, Nick, is we want to communicate to people out there. We want to, we want to share that message with people. So we have to fucking use this. And, and the way I look at it is like, we're on a, we're on an op to take their technology and use it against them. You know, you take that satellite, you take that tower, you take that thing and you use it for your goals and your operation, even though it's theirs and they built it to push their message on the world. I think it's our duty as free men, um, to not shun it, you know, don't, um, alienate it and say, yeah, fuck this, but, um, let's use it. Let's use it to empower the rest of us out there. Maybe it's a small group of us. Maybe it's a big group. I was actually telling the guy that everywhere between California and New York, that's America. No offense, California and New York. And, Cause I know there's some good Patriots out there. Um, there's a very small group of people in the world right now trying to gaslight everybody into thinking that's the way we should be. They're, they're promoting this, um, abnormal is normal and normal is abnormal. What we know is natural. Like that's where everyone says, well, what's normal? It's on a spectrum. They're, no, what's natural? What happens in nature? And this, what we're being bombarded with in our society is, is abnormal. And uh, if you and I and others like us in our field, whether it be artists, whether it be spokesmen, whatever it might be, right? If we can promote our message, and even if it gets right, like think about like World War II or something like the, the guerrilla rebel radios that were out there and just passing that message to one guy. And, and our message, Mike, can inspire one person to change it. It's worth it. Like the guerrilla radio shit. And get down with that. Unconventional warfare. We yeah, go right. unconventional. Um fuck man, I learned a lot from you today. Um I mean it's, I'm inspired to go watch this movie. I'm actually really excited about it. I usually am not excited about movies. <laughs> the last time I was excited about a movie was like when Charlie Sheen dropped out of the skylight in Navy SEALs. Oh fuck yeah. Man. Made me and Andy Stump. Him go to the Navy meet. I couldn't swim, so I became a green beret. But um, man, I'm excited. I'm excited for this, and I can't wait for people to hear about it, to watch it, and to experience it. I feel like I was. I was thinking when you were talking about the movie. When you watch this kind of movie, the way in which you watch it is important. Like you don't want people on their cell phones unless they're in a dark room. Like you want to experience this. It seems a little bit more impactful than. You know, uh, like you said, just an action movie. Um, all the links and all the things that we're going to use to promote the message for the movie is down below. Uh, I'm going to put Johnny's information and all this stuff down below as well. Um, I'll give you last words, Johnny. We get um, a very limited window here in this existence. Uh, live your life with meaning and purpose. Thanks. Appreciate you guys. Till next time. Peace out. Joining the Black Rifle Coffee Club is setting your coffee delivery to autopilot. As a club member, you get your favorite premium BRCC roast delivered fresh to your doorstep. All you have to do is pick your coffee, select the amount you want, then set the delivery schedule, and you're done. Easy as that. Not only will you get to... No not only will you get to knock co okay not only will you get to knock coffee off your grocery list for good but you also save cash over time since members get free shipping on deliveries club members also get exclusive discounts with partner brands like Philcraft Survival, Cryptech, Sig Sauer and more join the Black Rifle Coffee Club today start saving and enjoy the peace of mind that your coffee has been taken care of
that concludes today's training. Any questions? Woo! Drum titties, boy! <laughs>